What's the most important skill you've learned in high school so far? That was the pop-up debate prompt number three that I used just today, this school year, 2023. Welcome back to the series where I go through every single pop-up debate that I run with a group of my students. In this video, I'll walk you through what I was trying to do in this lesson, what moves I used before, during, and after the debate, what I think's happening in terms of the five key beliefs for student motivation, and where I intend to go with my pop-up debate game next. Let's dive into it. So first, let's talk about context. What's going on in today's lesson? As you can see here from this simple slide that I use to structure my lessons, we've got students beginning with a written warm-up, which is something that I do about 95% of the time. We've got students conducting the pop-up debate, which is directly based on the warm-up. I'll show you that in a minute. And then my students are going to be going over some pieces of writing that they've done recently on an assessment and then doing another piece of writing. And so overall, what I'm trying to accomplish is getting my students to communicate better, both through the Papa debate and through their writing. Specifically, I want them to work on specificity and explanation. And my other objective is helping them to own their learning in high school, own their own growth. So let's take a look at the warm-up that I use to try to facilitate this. And so this is the warm-up that I gave my students. This is what they began class reading and then responding to in writing. I didn't preface it with much. I just told them it's so important for you guys to take time periodically and figure out what is coming of your high school education. Where are you seeing growth? What challenges are you facing? I want you to be the kind of people who don't just go, 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 but who can also stop, reflect, and consolidate. As they're doing this writing, I'm walking around, looking over their shoulder, keeping aware of how long it's taking them, taking attendance, when my students finished writing, I had them put away their Chromebooks and get out a fresh page in their spiral notebook because there was a focus skill that I wanted us to get to, a focus skill that we were going to use in our pop-up debate. But first, just to get the speaking going, to rehearse speaking to one other person, I asked my students to share with their partner something that they had just written about. And let's just kick off like this. Tell your partner, we'll start with the person closest to the window, your answer to B. What is one challenge that you faced so far in high school? Just describe that for them. Window person first and then switch to the door person. As this think pair share was happening, I was walking around, listening, interacting with a few students, particularly a pair that were not really seeming to talk to each other. And then when that was done, I began eliciting student responses. I just asked for three, and in this case, I did volunteers because I knew that I didn't need to randomly call on kids for them to speak today. We were going to be doing a pop-up debate. Everyone was already going to speak. So I took three volunteers to share, and one student said that she had a hard time being motivated, especially... And one student said she had a hard time being motivated, especially in areas where she felt like she was bad at what she was doing. I made a big deal about this because that is the efficacy belief. Oh, snap. Who else feels that? If you're not good at it, you tend not to like it. I want to tell you something. That is very normal. Adults are the same way. When we feel like we're bad at something, we just don't like to do it. Okay? This idea of motivation, Ella brought up, Alexis brought up, and you, other, you guys brought up a lot of time management stuff too. These are things that I want you to be thinking about. That's why periodically we'll do these types of warm-ups. Because a good teacher is going to do their best to explain to you why what you're doing in class is important. That is a good teacher's job. We should be making the case to you for why we believe it's not a waste of time. But, but ultimately, guys, I can be as good at that in the world, and it won't really help you long term. What you need to figure out how to do is how to figure out why school is important to you. That's the key switch. And that's why questions like this are so important for you to start to ask yourself. Because I want to argue that there's going to be different reasons all across this room for why high school is important to you, how it's going to actually benefit your life. And the, the correct reason is the one that resonates with you, with your soul, with your being. That's the stuff that you want to find and latch on to. Because that way, when you do have a teacher someday, and you will, who never tells you why it's important, who maybe seems to signal that it's not important at all, you will still have power 
to learn. You'll still be empowered to do the work of learning to be successful in that class because you no longer need a teacher to make it interesting for you. You don't need a teacher to make it fun. And I want that for all of you. So this question, think about this. Think about this beyond just when I put it up on the screen sometimes. After that little micro nerd out on the five key beliefs, or maybe you want to call it a mini sermon, I shifted into today's pop-up debate. Remember, the prompt was, what's one of the most important skills you've grown so far in high school? And my students are ninth graders, so they've been in high school for about six and a half weeks. But before we get into the pop-up debate, I want to teach them one new skill to work on while they speak. As this early series of pop-up debates is happening, now I'm going to be layering on more and more things to think about, increasing the demand on students. Not me like being, you must do this, but me saying, here's another specific thing to think about. Here's another way that you can improve your speaking. And so eventually, my students are going to be doing a lot of cognitive juggling during pop -up debates, which is why I think the strategy is so good, because you just end up getting kids doing a ton of thinking. And I think it's this is partly why the kids end up learning a ton through pop a debate. Even though there's no direct instruction taking place, well, not much, there's this rehearsal of information and elaboration of information that's taking place, which helps them with long-term retention and deepening understanding. So let's take a look at moving into this skill we're going to focus on today, mini lesson. We are going to be having a pop-up debate here in a moment on something you've already written about. One of the most important skills you've grown so far this year. And it might be related to those challenges that you wrote about. It might just be unrelated to those. I don't really care. The content's going to be easy because you kind of can't be wrong. Okay. But the thing that I want to challenge you on is to work on a, a delivery skill. So in our Spirachi page, we're going to take notes on something that I think is useful no matter what you do in this world, how to deliver speech. And we're going to just use a simple acronym that a Colorado teacher named Eric Palmer came up with. So we're going to put the source for this. It's going to be Palmer. He wrote a book some time ago called Well Spoken. Okay. And Palmer basically says it comes down to PV legs. So across our screen here, across our page, just going to do something like this, all right? We are not going to take all these notes today. So you'll notice a lot of pauses in this segment of the lesson because I'm taking notes in front of the students, and I know that they're taking notes too. And this is an expectation that I've been reinforcing from literally the first day of school and every single day since. We basically take notes every single day. My students go through multiple spiral notebooks every year because paper is cheap, but learning is priceless. Towards the middle of the year, if I have kids who run out of spiral notebooks, I have like 100 in my classroom. I buy a bunch every August when they're like 10 cents at the local grocery store. So I'm a very lavish giver when it comes to spiral notebooks and a very lavish user of spiral notebooks. Point being, I'm leaving these pauses in the video because I want you to get a sense for the cadence, for the speed of direct instruction. It's not just me feeling the airwaves constantly. I'm being intentional about the words that I'm using trying not to overspeak, trying to basically with my words guide students' minds to be planted on what we're learning right now, which is how do you deliver effective speech? What goes into effective speech delivery? But I am going to add something that you all identified to me was important. Last time that I, we had a pop debate and I asked you what we need to get better at. So last time we worked on voice. I had you guys work on voice. And voice is just the idea that every word is heard. Some of you do not struggle with this. You've never struggled with it. You don't know what it's like to struggle with this. Others of you have been being told your whole life, speak up, speak up, speak up. For those of you who have been told to speak up a lot, voice is something that you need to keep thinking about because you've got to acclimate yourself to realizing that when it feels like you're yelling, you're actually just speaking loud enough. Okay, that's not our focus skill for this debate, though. Our focus skill for this debate is something that you guys pointed out last time. It is eye contact. You said a lot of us were just looking at our paper or we were just looking at Mr. Stewart. We were not making good eye contact. So the thing with eye contact is that there, is there such thing as too much? 
Have you ever had a conversation with someone that you just wish would kind of look away a little bit because it's like uncomfortable? So there is such thing as too much. I, I would argue it's it's not socially intelligent to do too much eye contact. If you just gaze into someone's eyes the whole time that you're talking to them, you'll make them feel uncomfortable and they will not walk away with a good impression of you. So when you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a good rule of thumb is like 80% of the time. You want to mostly make eye contact. Because it indicates that you're paying attention. It indicates that you value them. Uh, uh, that that Crawford is a bit frightening, but yep, it's 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 the right idea. But when you're speaking to a whole group, you just want to attempt to connect with all listeners. That's the gold standard. Attempt to connect with all listeners. And that's a pretty high bar. In a class like this, because in a class like this, unless you are blessed enough to be in Blakeland's seat or Oliver's seat or Bethlehem's seat or Tristan's seat, you're going to have to kind of reposition your body beyond just your seating area. Okay, so notice here I'm being really specific now. We've taken a little bit of notes, not a bunch, but now I'm modeling for them. I'm talking through specific places in the classroom where eye contact is going to demand that you do different things. And then you'll notice I prompt my students to self-differentiate. And I say, essentially, you can move if you want so that you can make eye contact attempts with 100% of the class, or you can stay where you're at and just do the swivel. And I noticed, I didn't film this pop-up debate with students because we're not there yet, but I noticed that students did the whole range, the whole spectrum of possible eye contact moves is what they pulled from, depending on their level of comfort and awareness of eye contact. To attempt it with everybody. You know what I mean? You're going to have to, like, like, like if you're Adeline, you're going to have to, if you want to be perfect at this, you're going to have to take a few steps so that you can see everyone. Or else you could do like this sprinkler thing, which, you know, that's just going to be kind of weird for all of us too. So I'm not saying that you have to do that today. You don't have to do that. Okay. Today, just try to connect with at least 50% of the people in the room. Because even if you are Adeline, you can attempt that because Adeline could stand up, she could face that map, and she could just go like this. When she talks, and there she's gonna get about 50% of the people in the room. But feel free if you wanna really push yourself on this, if it just feels awkward to you or uncomfortable. I mean, does anyone feel uncomfortable when you stand up in the middle of the whole class and you're just like surrounded? Yeah, so like if you wanna just take a few steps and get to where you're not surrounded, feel free. And I promise this will become normal. People will do it. Maybe who knows? You'll be the first one. And then it'll be much easier for you to attempt eye contact. So, Tupsy. Are we just going to stand up here and go like this the whole time we deliver our pop-up debate? No. No, because that will make Tupsy very uncomfortable. All right, low gangster, you can't do that. Don't do it, low gang. Can't. No. But we are going to just try to practice scanning around a bit. So this is our focus skill for today. And that is really all that I had to say about that. So now let's move into what I was doing during this pop-up debate. You remember in the previous ones, I was pretty much just sitting up in the front of the room, looking at my spiral notebook and checking off student names, taking notes sometimes of what they were saying or patterns that I was noticing. But I was not looking at them. This is me trying to decrease the pressure of those early pop-up debates. Now, however, in order for me to see how well we're doing eye contact, I did have to look at them more, and I also wanted to model me participating. I wanted to stand up twice in the pop-up debate and talk. So I did. And a couple of things happened that I noticed that I think are really helpful. So first of all, there were some times when I wanted to stand up and speak. I saw an opportunity to speak, something I wanted to say. And I would go to stand up and a student would also stand up and I would then get the model yielding the floor. This is a skill that I don't really teach explicitly, but it's so important especially with ninth graders. Yielding the floor respectfully, without a big show, without the whole, you know, that thing, which I've seen many students do over the years. I want to teach them how to yield the floor in a professional way, in a courteous way, in a low-key way that just lets the debate continue to be the focus, not the antics that can sometimes arise. So me standing up twice helped me to model yielding the floor. During one of my speeches in both of the classes where I ran this pop debate, I specifically looked for a student who shared something that responded to the prompt but left me wanting more. So, for example, many students said that they've grown this year in the area of time management. But after I'd heard this about the fifth time, I stood up and I said, Hey, so-and-so, I love this idea of you growing in time management. It's really interesting to me. 
I'm struggling with it myself. Could you just give me something specific, you or anyone else, that has helped you with time management so that I can up my game? And I'm trying to be a little playful with it and get the students to laugh at me, be just a bit goofy and awkward. Not to like de-seriousness, de-seriotize, not to undermine the beauty and importance of what we're doing, but to just model that we can take ourselves less seriously during Papa debates and have fun, not always sounding perfect. In my other speech, I stood up to acknowledge eye contact and I made it on prompt too. I said, one thing that I'm growing in is appreciating all the eye contact in this room. When I see you guys do, the, do your little scans, connect with each other's gazes. I just get this warm and beautiful feeling inside of my soul and I'm learning how to really appreciate that. So I sit down and I just modeled for them being on prompt, being a little lighthearted, but I also reinforced our target skill. After this debate was done, I didn't really have time for post-debate reflection. And plus, I know that for the next few Papa debates, I want to teach the rest of the PV Legs acronym from Eric Palmer. So I just ended it really simply. I reaffirmed for them why we did this debate. And I said, all teachers should be trying to explain to you why their class is important. That is part of our job and it's a good thing for us to do. But you're not always going to have teachers who will do that or who are good at that. And so the key way to have power and freedom and autonomy in school is to learn how to do that for yourself, to figure out how you are growing, how your life is being enriched from school short little mini sermon capping off a short beautiful little pop-up debate and then we moved into the rest of our lesson so in terms of the five key beliefs beneath student motivation what am i doing here well let's start at the bottom of the pyramid with credibility by giving this pop a debate prompt, I'm signaling to students that I care about them as more than just world history learners. I care about them as high school participants, people who are going through this four years of life, people for whom I want much to come of these four years. I'm also signaling that they are important, that their role in that is critical. And so I'm sending strong signals of belonging you students have ideas, you have reflections, you have observations that are so important to this process of growing in high school. In terms of value, I came up with this prompt specifically when reflecting on strategy six in my book, The Will to Learn. Strategy six is called Valued Within, and it's all about creating opportunities for students to come up with the reasons why school is important, why it matters to their life, and getting some of that responsibility off of me. In terms of the effort belief, I'm teaching them one specific thing to focus on to get better as speakers. That's woodenization, strategy seven in my book. And in terms of efficacy, I'm implying here that the definition of success in high school is growing, which is strategy nine in my book, define success wisely, early, and often. So there's a lot happening here in terms of student motivation. All right, if you have any questions at all about where I'm going, what I'm doing, anything in the video I didn't explain, please put them in the comments. Thanks for viewing, and I'll see you next time. Subscribe if you don't want to miss them.